ladies, gentlemen, dear sisters, dear spiritist brothers, our most sincere wishes for peace. Since unmemorable times, the human being has been trying to interpret the very human being. The biggest enigma, however, for this interpretation is the human creature who consists, each one of them, of a whole universe. Considering the magnificence of the cosmos and the beauty that is present everywhere, we are led to agree with the great Russian writer Dostoevsky in his book The Idiot, when a Christian prince says an unforgettable line, the beauty will save the world. And it's exactly this beauty present in everything, everywhere, and in all individuals that calls our attention. Even the Pithecanthropus erectus, who imagined in that universe of shadow, catastrophes, tectonic plates shocking against each other, not having any clue about the reality of life, let alone death, Inside him, there was a question. When he abandons the grotesque shape, semi-animalistic, to be able to enter the period called by the eminent coder of Spiritism, Alan Kardec, as the period of humanity, and since then, the human mind has been trying to interpret the enigmas of life, especially the reason for suffering. Who are we? Where do we come from? Where are we bound? What's the reason for pain? Thanks to this, there has been throughout history, since the ancient Ur in Chaldea, through Abraham, the divine thought to explain the reality of life. Today, it's that city in Iraq, disrupted and known for its internal wars. And since then, humanity got to know five great religions. Naturally, these religions were Judaism, Brahmanism, Buddhism, and more recently, the Christian doctrine and its branch called Spiritism. For us to focus on the understanding of the human creature, it was the Greeks who in the West, for the first time, tried to establish a thought about the human creature. And this thought, through Lucifer, Lucretius, Democritus, asserted that everything that exists is constituted by indivisible particles, atoms, and that which agglutinates presents form. But after it disaggregates, it becomes the nothingness, the annihilation. On the other hand, in the same period, a little after Pericles, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, it will be established that life has a meaning and the human creature has an origin. And to this philosophical proposal, it was given the name of idealism. And this idealism culminates in the Socratic, 
Platonic, Aristotelian thought, demonstrating that life is an indestructible reality, presenting itself in an immense variety of manifestations, all of them under the aegis of this unknown force which we call life. These thoughts evolved until the 15th century, when the thought awoke the old doctrines of the Renaissance, and around the 16th century, thanks to our great thinkers and idealists, captained by Galileo Galilei, that that was called the empirical science decided to distance itself from the religious rules, which had for essential concept, believe it to see it. Later on, Quantum physics, around 1923, established that first it's necessary to believe, then you can see, because everything we see is not exactly as we see it. It's a manifestation presented by these particles, named atoms, which were penetrated as deeply as the most intimate structures of its composition, reaching energy. We live in a universe of energy that manifests itself in various modulations, from the most beautiful ones until the most rudimentary and primitive. And it's exactly in this period that the empiric thought through the laboratory investigations yields to scientific investigation and the religion is put aside because it couldn't fulfill the immense needs of the human creature. From then, we will make a quantic leap to a beautiful morning at the beginning of the third millennium, at the White House, at the beginning of summer, when President Bill Clinton has a visit from a group of scientific investigators who intend to present a draft of the first human genome, that is the human creature, because the brain possesses this peculiarity in the human being of thinking, of having emotions, and above all, of imagining, allowing great leaps in the direction of almost the inconceivable. In that morning, then, in June, in the East Room of the White House, His Excellency, the President of the United States, welcomed the remarkable geneticist Francis, who dedicated his whole life to the investigation of the human being. Francis Collins was finishing the first draft of the human genome. Next to him, the great science investigator, who was also trying to understand the reality of the human being, our destiny, our past, our future, and the human genome was the great enigma to be investigated. In that unforgettable morning, His Excellency, after receiving a synthesis of the decoded human genome, said ipsis verbis, from now on, we can more easily comprehend how life was created and how God created the universe. Francis Collins had dedicated himself to study with several universities in this country for over 30 years this enigma that constitutes the human being and consequently 
everything that exists in it. And on presenting the decoding of the human genome, he asserted that we are composed of three million letters and that each letter is made up of four other letters. If we were to read all this structure, taking one second per letter, we would need 31 years to understand this amalgam of the reality that is life. And if by any chance we were to write compendiums on the human genome, it would be necessary a 32-floor building to store only the great facts of this life. But Dr. Francis Collins demonstrated that some higher power, which he names conscience, had elaborated this miracle through the unfathomable, the time and the extraordinary passing of distances in the past. He himself had been a materialist, a biologist, a chemist, and ended up in genetics, fascinated by understanding the human genome. He had the opportunity to look into the religions to try to find the answer for the thinking being. And none of these great religions which took over the world had a basic answer for the phenomenon of the pain. It was through a friend that he received an invitation to consult a religious person from the 19th century, who talked about faith in a very special manner. And after having heard this religious person through his written works, he started to dedicate himself to the human genome and confirmed that in the very genome there is the presence of God. It doesn't matter the name you give it, conscience, cause and causatory, reality, absolute, the non-thinking being. And the work presented fascinated the scientists in such a way that another geneticist, Dean, dedicated himself to the same investigation. Dean Hammer presented his work in 2007, more or less, demonstrating that the human being carries in its organism the presence of God. God doesn't belong to religion. It's an innate, organic reality that is found in its very essence of our lives. Between the temporal lobes, there is the area dedicated only to God's thought. And making an analysis even deeper, Dr. Dean Hammer established that we have 35,000 genes. When people believed that we had more than a hundred thousand, and that one of these main genetic phenomena was dedicated to God. God is a physical element inside us. All of us are born theists. The social condition, the environment, the various factors take us to adopt the beliefs or disbeliefs of accepting or neglecting that that is a reality. And he could identify this gene, which he named VMAT2. It's the gene that represents the divinity. But his proposal is so fascinating that by discovering that we possess only 35,000 genes, when it was thought that the number was much higher, it was found that the difference between the human being and a rat is only 200 genes. And that's why so many times 
the world involve us in high responsibilities, while some individuals have less than 200 genes, which explain their conduct as rats in the process of evolution. It's a scientific data. However, while this happened in the US, it's in Oxford, an admirable investigator was going through a very grave moment. She had been invited to quantum physics. She, a psychologist, American, professor in Oxford in England, going through a period of emotional transition, had lost her faith in God. She carried with her some childhood traumas that tormented her. She was invited by an English publisher to write a book about the subject of quantum physics in an easier language for people who are not dedicated to this science. And the success of the book was astonishing. The publisher asked her then to write another book. But during this period, Dr. Dana Zohar started to investigate why there was so much pain in the world. She herself married to a prosperous psychologist, mother of two daughters, he started to feel strange sensations deep inside her thoughts. And not realizing, she got into a depressive state. This state got worse when her two daughters asked her to go on a trip to the top of the world. And by doing this to please the young ones, in that golden times of the yellow scarves that invaded the West, bringing the Eastern message, Dr. Dana experienced a fall in her intellectual production and was advised by a friend to look for a psychotherapist. She herself admits that the whiskey taken at night while listening to the piano didn't help her achievement as a distinguished master at Oxford University. And it was during that time that the human genome took over America and brought an extraordinary contribution to the individuals of genetic science. Is it possible that there is really a God spot inside our brains? Would it have any meaning? At the same time, in California, the Canadian geneticist Michael Persinger started to conduct experiments with epileptics. How did an epileptic seizure happen? Why there was this disorder of death in individuals? And taking some epileptic patients to a laboratory, he used some very delicate devices so he could observe observe the brain reactions and verifying that it was possible to detect thoughts not yet transformed into emotions and into reality, he exclaimed, oh my God, at that moment, the needle of the device which detected the emotions took a jump. He found that strange. What would have happened for the device to react to the word God? So he pronounced other words family, peace, happiness, disgrace, and no emotions from the electronic device. At last, he said, how curious. It was then, when he pronounced the word God again, that the needle seemed to have gained force and started to vibrate. He pronounced the name of God in ten idioms. And every time he said it, there was a reaction from that admirable seismograph specialized in measuring the brain, emanations. Dr. Dana Zohar heard about the experiment and because she was going through a terrible period of materialism, of depression, not being able to meet the demands of the publisher who had asked her for a second work, she decided to abandon Oxford and came to Los Angeles to study with Dr. Persinger this reality that fascinated her.
And then she started to investigate and noticed that the human creature, since the beginning of the 20th century, had been invariably measured by the IQ. This IQ was so important in the First World War that the US sent two million soldiers to take the IQ test so they could have their reactions assessed and naturally become true men of steel, able to overcome any difficulties. She then realized that behind this IQ there was something, because the ones who presented a high IQ of 130, 150, 160 points, invariably were not so happy. They were misanthropes. The ability to have a privileged mind somehow distanced them from social life. And she concluded that the individuals had to have another way to express their reality. It was Daniel Goleman, the American psychologist, who realized that it was necessary to have an emotional balance, to have the true happiness, and observed that in the Forbes list, among the ten richest men in the world, not all were holders of a high IQ, but of a high EQ, the emotional quotient. They were people who felt fulfilled very easily, who had direct contact in a fascinating way, who could smile, communicate and give life to life. So he created between 1970 and 1980 the EQ, but something was still missing. Something that was in the depths of these temporal lobes and that told us about transcendence, that was able to explain the reality of life. After all, energy condenses into matter, and matter expands into energy. Light has its property in the vortexes of being energy and matter simultaneously. In the same way, we live in the world of bands. As Albert Einstein used to say, we live in the world of ideas, of mental phenomena, of feelings. And when asked around 1905, after he had presented his theory and the draft of the relativity of time and space, the eminent master established in a smooth way. I don't believe in God, I know. He seemed to repeat the quote by Carl Gustav Jung when asked if God existed. Jung, the father of analytical psychology, author of Human Archetypes, of the heritage of the past, answered with a smile, if God exists, I don't know. It's not important for me. The importance is that it is. It is. It's necessary to feel. And then Dr. Dana observed that it's through the feelings, not the belief. Why do we believe today and tomorrow we cease to believe? We don't believe today day and tomorrow we start to believe. It's necessary to believe this reality from inside out. And she presented her study in a fantastic book, Spiritual Quotient. We had the opportunity of meeting her in a movement in the city of Zurich about peace, and we asked her, you believe in God? No. I don't believe in God, but I cannot deny that there is a spiritual reality, especially now when the medical science, after wandering through the winding ways of neglectfulness, had been researching with the help of the University of Virginia about reincarnation or the successive existences adopted since Brahmanism, Hinduism, the ancestral thinking, 
from those who were the greatest thinkers of humanity and that the previous life is not a previous life. It's a previous existence because life is unique, according to Paul the Apostle. One day, Buddha, talking to Chuna, one of his disciples, asked, What happens? What is the opposite of life? And he replied, Death? No, rebirth. Because nobody dies. Death is a change of the basic structure of human vibrations. And then that doctrine presented at the University of Virginia, which today has approximately 20,000 cases in its psychology lab, to be able to study the probability of previous existence, it was necessary to create in parapsychology the opportunity of doing deeper researches, not just neglect the reality of something indestructible but investigate. That's when the probability of spirituality and medicine emerges. Spirituality and sociology, spirituality and psychology. So this SQ, because there was already the EQ, the quotient of spiritual nature, would naturally be a redundancy. And Dr. Dana decided to use a spiritual quotient, establishing the SQ. Today we are the IQ the EQ and the SQ, predominating in us this conscience of a spiritual nature. It's fascinating then to observe that the experiences from this remarkable investigator, Michael Persinger, were confirmed by Dr. Rama Chandra, who had the opportunity of investigating and confirmed that matter is devoid of spontaneity and that an inner force controls it and that the human creature is nothing but the result of an evolution process, that part of the agglutination of the molecules of minerals, vegetables, animals, humans, towards the greatness of the immortal spirit, according to the distinguished coder Alan Kardec, because from the different branches of Christianity, the spiritist science will emerge. Alan Kardec will say that spiritism is a science that studies the origin, the nature of the spirit and the relationship with the spiritual life. He will establish that this science marches side by side with conventional science. But it doesn't stop where science stops. Science studies the effects while spiritism goes back to the causes. If, by any chance, science proves that we spiritists are wrong in one point, spiritism will adjust and follow science. However, since this thinking was exposed, science has left ordinary chemistry to inorganic chemistry, from Newtonian physics to the physics of probabilities. This physics of probabilities fascinates me. It's necessary first to believe to be able to see later. When we were accustomed to fool ourselves with the magical dance of the atoms, the formation of the molecules, with the reality of the objectives. After 60 years of research, last year it was detected one more formation of atomic nature in the deepest intimacy of energy. This subject is so serious that it's not necessary to be proven. Nothing can be proven through quantum physics unless believed. Because to prove the reality of the thought, that that today constitutes a proof, later, with the advances of science and very delicate equipment, we supersede this proof and enter a more special field.
So the spiritist science comes and totally confirms the investigations to which we referred. When Alan Kardec, the eminent professor, reviled, has the opportunity of communicating with the spirits who are not visible, they were nuclear conceptions, he asks, what is God? Until then, science, theology, philosophy always asked the question the wrong way. Who is God? And inside the word who, human creature is included. And we had an anthropomorphic God. Who is God? It's, it was not already established that God is a human being. Because the word who represents precisely who is he. Alan Kardec has the sensitivity of asking, Who is God? And the spirits answer, The supreme intelligence of the universe, the primal cause of all things. And what proof can we have of its existence? They answered, you can find it in an axiom, you apply it to your sciences. All effect comes from a cause, hence an intelligent effect will present a cause of an intelligent nature. And later, Alan Kardec goes on asking, and in question number 621, he asks, where is is the law of God written? And the answer is absolutely of the point of God. In the conscience. And where is the conscience? It was one of the most difficult questions of psychology. Maybe the answer, in my modest opinion, most equivalent to that, is the one by the father of psychology. Carl Gustav Jung has the opportunity to say, that conscience is not the knowledge. Until then, mid-20th century, it was believed that an educated person with a great academic background was a person of conscience. And he establishes that this is someone with knowledge. The problematics of the conscience transcends the intellectual capacity. So that's where the what is comes in. This admirable spiritual contribution. Modest people are capable of having an elevated and transcending reasoning. But this conscience, where would it be? asks Jung. And he himself one day would write, It was all so sudden. I felt something grab me by the neck like a spirit and took me to the typewriter when I started to write non-stop. Psychography. Non-stop for three days and three nights. And when I was finished, it was written for the title, Answer to Job. Job is a biblical character who was tempted by the demon through God. He loves you because you gave him everything. Wife, daughter, servants, land, power. Take them and you will see that he will reveal himself against you. And God, anthropomorphic, who had passions and doubts, decided to kill Job's livestock. And Job rendered prayer praises to God. Then he killed Job's slaves, and Job rendered praises to God, decided to kill Job's son, and from Job a praise was emanated. If this is God's will, so be it. And his wife rarely resigned, like every woman. How come? How can you believe this individual who takes everything from you? Where is your God? And he says, even if he takes you from me, I will go on. He was a chauvinist man. I will keep thinking about God. And God then, before this trial, turns to Satan. He doesn't love me because I gave him, but he loves me because he feels me. So I will give him back everything, the livestock, the slaves, and then Jung. And this fantastic book has the opportunity to say that conscience is the discernment of the knowledge. If we recall the period of the Second World War, 
we will see that the Nazis, especially in the SS troops, they were very intelligent. They were the holders of a wide knowledge, absolutely destitute of conscience. For example, not long ago, during the Second World War, we see that this state was not a characteristic of the Nazism, of the SS troops, but the human creature, who is the same in any regime. In Turkey, between the years of 1915 and 1917, there was a war. A war against the Armenians. They inhabit part of the land of Stambul, today the capital that once was Constantinople. And in Stambul, the Armenian area is very wide. Or better, in all Turkey, there was a population of three million individuals. And so they decided, even during World War II, humanity immersed in that chaos. I beg your pardon. Because this is some inheritance, very dear, one of those long-term effects of COVID. It has been with me, blessed me and said, you will regret. And it left me with this typical cough. So I'm sorry. And they started a war and the poor Armenians couldn't hide. And the killing was so cruel that only during this period they killed a million and five hundred thousand people. What took Pope Francis to say that there had been an Armenian genocide? While naturally in this building it was established that it shouldn't be put this way to avoid harming the image of Turkey in the world scenario. But it was a calamity. And we will think about a fact that happened in this war. In a Sunday morning, in a small Turkish Armenian village, the family is at the table, the father at one end, the mother at the other. At the two other sides, two young women, one 12 and another 15 year old. There's a strong noise on the ground floor. It's the front door that's being busted. A small group of soldiers walks up the stairs and leading them, a man wearing a cap that covered his front head and part of his face. That man in command steps into the dining room while that modest family of peasants have their meal. He pulls up his gun and without a word kills the man at the table, turns and kills the woman who was at the other end looks at the two horrified young women, grabs the 12-year-old and throw her to the jackals. They were not men, they were biped jackals, who started to rape her, to destroy her, as if she was an object, and kill her, and take the other one by the hair, drag her down the stairs, and take her to a place where they used as a brothel. There, there were the Armenian young women who had their souls torn down. And that young one, he didn't only kill her parents and sister, but also destroyed her soul. That opportunity of believing in the human creature. She, one year later, managed to seduce a security man and escaped, freed herself from the captivity place and disappeared. We are now in Stambul, around 1927. An ambulance stops in front of an orthopedics clinic door. On a stretcher, a man with an unknown diagnosis. His body is taken by a terrible dermatitis. The rotten flesh is falling off. The odor is unbearable. Then the chief physician of the clinic looks at him and the man is almost in agony. There's no place for him in the clinic. It's a specialized clinic, but he will die. How to deny him the opportunity of not dying alone? The director decides to put him in a distant room. 
in a very isolated wing, but all the doctors and paramedics refused to see this man in a cadaverous condition. Standing next to him, a nurse. She's maybe the best employee of the clinic. And he asks uh, her en passant, would you take care of this patient until he dies, which will happen at any moment? And she answers in a few words, it's my duty. I'm a nurse. I'm here to serve, to stay with the patient until the last moment or to follow him in freedom. So she goes to take care of him. There was no gauze. She rips up some sheets and starts to clean his wounds, to remove the flesh, to make it bleed, and the man didn't die in that evening, nor the next day, nor the next month, and nor two months later. Two months later he could leave the hospital. The harmful scars remained from the satanic infirmity, which seemed to have claws to hold the body. The scars were enormous, but life characterizes itself by the beauty of the very verb to live. And when he goes to say goodbye, he says to the director of the clinic, I am a governmental authority and I will intervene with the state so that this clinic will be given the greatest donations because it saved my life. And the doctor very moved by the miracle, says, but don't thank us, Your Excellency. Thank that young woman over there. She looked after you for two months. She was like a daughter to Your Excellency. She was next to you all the moments of your life. She tried to give you not only the assistance, but also the therapy of the best quality. And there it is, your life, back in a fascinating way. He stood up, pulled up his cap and looked at her. He held out his hand. Lady, I want to thank you. But she didn't reach his. She nodded and said, it's not necessary, Your Excellency. I noticed, I noticed that you speak Turkish with an accent. Yes, I'm Armenian. You don't say, I was in Armenia, I was there during the war. Yes, I remember, Your Excellency, I remember. Your Excellency was in my home one Sunday morning with a group of monsters. And I still remember Your Excellency pulling out your gun and killing my father, my mother. Then you gave away my sister to the savages who followed you. Your Excellency made me a sexual slave, abused me all you could, but I managed to escape to avenge. I established in my condition of myometan that I would revenge every single bit, that I would chase you wherever Your Excellency go. And God, this God that commands life, gave me the opportunity to meet Your Excellency. He paled. He stepped back. When I entered the clinic, did you recognize me? Oh yes, Your Excellency, the victim never forgets, although the killer rarely remembers. And why didn't you kill me? It was a question I asked myself when I saw Your Excellency. I recalled my sister's eyes falling over the food, the blood running down, and you were now in my hands. I thought of taking revenge on every piece of your flesh, but life has already done that, because it's a law that I cannot understand, that according to the evil we do, no, it's not the law of this or that, it's not the Italian law, it's the divine conscience. But what made the difference was that during this time, these 10 years that kept us apart, I became a Christian. 
And one man, a Jewish man, had the opportunity when being crucified to say, forgive them, Father, for they don't know what they're doing. And he told me to forgive. So I forgive you totally. I forgive you, Your Excellency. Now I can shake your hand. Brian Zand, a Protestant of Polish origins, who wrote an extraordinary book about forgiveness, extreme, but total forgiveness. He writes in this fact that the total forgiveness, but without any pain, grudge or resentment, forgiveness is the culminating moment of the Christian doctrine, of the Spiritist doctrine, because the charity of our existence is the pardon of God to our terrible inversions of the right to life. The reincarnation is the forgiveness of the divine mercy, giving us the chance of correcting the opportunity of reparation and the pardon must not be a condition. Tradition establishes that the pardon, to be true, must have the forgetting of the offense. It's a religious opinion. Psychology says it differently. Forgive is to forget. It's not reacting. It's not giving back the harm we receive in the same way. It's an act of forgiving. Forgetting is a matter of memory. There are facts we forget unwillingly. There are others, though, that we wish to forget and just cannot. Only time. Then Dr. Zand establishes the need to forgive the contemporary culture, made of hatred, resentment and outrage. And that's why Jesus said, I will never leave you alone. He was very close to Jerusalem when he then said he would give a testimony. And Peter asked him, Lord, but since you're leaving, are we going to be orphans? No, I won't leave you as orphans. I will ask my Father, and He will send you the Comforter, the Paraclete, the Spirit of Truth, and He will tell you new things, and will be with you until the end of time. And it came through the revelation of the spiritual world in this country in the unforgettable night of March 31, 1848 in Hydesville when the Fox sisters answered the knockings of Charles B. Rosna in Rochester. They had the opportunity of opening the horizons and say that the graves don't keep the beings in eternal sleep. Life reveals itself even in the manifestations of disincarnated nature. They come back to tell us. And when the table-turning phenomenon spread throughout America, and it was later started to happen in Salserton, in England, and it appeared in London and crossed the English Channel, reaching the residence of Mrs. Planamazon in Paris. And Professor Revile, on the last Tuesday of May in 1855, seeing the table move in contact with the humans, realized that it was not about curiosity, nor of the contact with the feet. He realized that there was was an intelligence beyond the table that gave answers according to the character of the questions. And from those questions a book will emerge. On April 18th, 1857, the second coming of the Christ through the Book of Spirits, such a remarkable work of philosophy that just in 1019 questions attests 
to the reality of the immortal being, giving meaning to our empty lives. This is a period of an empty life, without purpose, without an ideal, full of resentment, of ego, even among those who adopt the spiritist philosophy. It's a philosophy because it explains who we are, why we suffer from pain. It was the quote that most impressed me from spiritism. It's the blessing that God reserves for the elect. It's in the Gospel according to Spiritism, in a message by a friendly spirit. And when I read that the pain was the greatest blessing that God reserved for the elect, I thought, oh my God, then what does He reserve to the ones not elect? And I began to think, but this is a doctrine of a terrible nature, pessimistic, that preaches pain. But it's right, because, you know, through this cutting process that the raw diamond becomes a luminous star to illuminate humanity. Spiritism as a science will demonstrate that science does the investigation because it's the ambassador of God and more importantly, it's through the law, that law adopted by this remarkable man, Francis Collins who will find in the law a law of justice that Alan Kardec talks about in the third part of the Spirit's book about the natural law, the law of love that he will divide in ten laws from this extraordinary law of love the law of justice, the law of work the law of destruction and he asks, why is there the war? Why does the war exist? Devastating and perverse. The war is the result of the predominance of the animal nature over the spiritual nature of the human creature. And what does God want from the war? Promote progress. It's a paradox. All the greatest discoveries are made during the war, to end it quickly. And peace is the interval between two wars. When we see the World War I, which was considered the worst war of all times, we said, never more war. Then the Second World War began. 60 million people assassinated because of one psychopath, because of a tormented man who established the need of a pure race, a race capable of living inside a Nazi party for a thousand years, but it didn't last much, because there was another law that is above this German law established on the persecution of Jews and any peoples which were not German. And this law says we are equal from the same origin. A very curious story narrates that one day a wheat grain was very tired of its stem. But when it looked above the vegetables, it saw a portion of wheat that was swaying in the wind. And he said, oh, I am here and it's there. But what are we after all? We are grains from the same bag. The sower flew his plane with an open bag and the grains fell over the chaff, the bad seeds. But all grew, and the wheat turned into golden grains above the chaff, which was separated and burned, so they could be used as compost for this grain of wheat called love. Hence, the law of love is above all other laws, and it's inside the conscience. Alan Kardec established the need of the practice of charity, the holy virtue, faith, hope, and charity. There can only be charity if there is faith, if there is hope for superior results. Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible to do charity. So for charity, 
ability to be legitimate, genuine, it's necessary that we have love, especially self-love, love to oneself, because the ones who don't love themselves cannot love anyone. We have passions, we have the Freudian libido, we have interests, but we don't have this feeling of love, respect, of consideration for the others, and of seeing in the enemy, in the other, that, that maybe we would like to be, and that because we can't, we look down on the others, to put them on our level. So Dr. Brian Zant establishes the need for integral love, the total forgiveness, that comes to approach from the spiritist science, its ethical, moral, religious aspect. Why science? Because it investigates. Why philosophy? Because it clarifies the enigmas. And Socratic moral ethics. Alan Kardec asks in the Spirit's book, what is the most efficient practical method to be happy in this world and face the challenges, the difficulties? And the Spirit's answer, notice how delicate a wise person person from antiquity has already told you, know yourself. And many people believe this quote to be by Socrates. Absolutely not. When Socrates set out to visit Apollo's sanctuary at Delphi, because Socrates was very ugly, poor man, Plato, Themistocles, his disciples, say that his feet were too big and he couldn't wear shoes. But wisdom was in this man, in an extraordinary manner. He revolutionizes philosophy and becomes the father of self-enlightenment. It's narrated that minor philosophers, like there are everywhere, major and minor, went to Athens, to the sanctuary at Delphi. They despised Socrates. They talked about his ugliness, about his difficulty. His mother was a childbirth helper. And that's why he utilizes the childbirth method to deliver the knowledge, educate, educate to take it out from the inside because we bring it from other experiences that Plato calls reincarnationist nature. So there were those minor philosophers who asked in the sanctuary at Delphi, who is the wisest man in Greece? And the Pythonist transfigured answers, Socrates. They got more angry because they expected, maybe, some of them to earn the title. So they came back to Athens, they saw Socrates, he was well, relaxed, barefoot, philosophizing, presenting his dialectics. And they said, Socrates, do you know that Apollo, the god, had the occasion to say that you are the wisest man in Greece? And he said, no, I didn't know that. But if he said so, he said the truth. Do you believe yourself to be the wisest man in Greece? Of course, because maybe I am the only one who knows that doesn't know anything. And this is wisdom, to know that we don't know anything. Because the more we know, the more questions we have. The ordinary person from the countryside to eat, sleep, have sex, the primary sensations. And that asset of the transitional emotions, the more he aspires, the more infinite the horizon becomes. Then he went to the sanctuary. And when he arrived there on the portico, it was written and had been written since the great Greece, know thyself. And that seemed so fantastic to him that he took it to Athens and became its disseminator. The spirits didn't say it was by Socrates. A wise person from antiquity has already told you. Because he had learned with the oldest and the wisest from the Greek thought. So this sense of knowledge, of knowing, of improving, 
is the basic point of the ethics in the Spirit's doctrine. And because it has Christianism as its basis, it's a great doctrine, because it clarifies through love all the enigmas of the thought. It also has a religious character, but not religious formulas, not the mystic manifestations, but the meaning of religiosity, to practice the mediumship religiously, to apply the passes religiously and for free. Time is money, but our currency is from heaven. This feeling of love to make earth happier, the human creatures more dignified to understand beauty. Because when Dostoevsky wrote that in the book The Idiot, he was in Siberia, exiled by Stalin, because he said something. He was a communist and referred to Stalin as the man with a mustache. So he was punished to go to Siberia in exile for five years for ironizing the emerit Stalin, murderer to the level of Hitler, a little bigger maybe, because he killed many more. Only in Moscow it's attributed to him over two million deaths. The prisons had more than a hundred thousand prisoners. In the name of that revolutionary moment in 1917, when the Tsar Alexander II was removed from power and the Bolshevich revolution brought to the world the ideas of Marx, Engels, of social economic equality, never though moral, because we are different. Each one of us is in a step of the evolution. And Allan Kardec said it well, the moral aristocracy, those spirits of wisdom who are capable of sacrifice, who are capable of abnegation. I recall one day an act of intolerance by somebody to the medium Chico Xavier. A man slapped his face because the person went to him seeking for a word from beyond the grave. And his deceased wife came and wrote him a letter through the hands of the medium and took the opportunity because it said that women take the opportunity. They are very wise and described his conduct during life. He expected her to come and say that he was an angel, an archangel. She said it was not with the devil, it was the devil himself. So he slapped Chico's face and cursed. Then Chico smiled, and when he arrived home, his tears brimming abundant. Emmanuel, his spiritual guide, asked him, Why do you cry? He said, But my brother, didn't you see? That man spit on my face. I saw it, Chico. And what's the matter? Are you heartbroken for that? Well, yes, I mean, yes. So I will teach you something. The next time somebody gets mad and spit on your face, you say, what? Oh, it's raining. And go on. Then Shiko will state that the true spiritist is the one who cries while wiping the tears of another one who has deeper tears. So Jesus came to be with us at this time of uncertainties, of conflicts, of psychological nature. It can be said that this is the moment of the psychological conflicts, of depression, of aggressiveness, of lack of meaning. What can we do? Love. They don't know what they are doing. To understand, we've already reached a step that gives us the perception of comprehending the other. The others are me projected on them. And usually we are only that that in reality we cultivate. 
Cultivating the Spiritist doctrine is to live 360 degrees, not only 90 degrees of our perception, or a full 180 degrees to enjoy wholeness. The Spirit John Angelis often tells me, feed yourself on the Spiritist bread. And I asked, is there Spiritist bread? Yes, there is. The bitter bread of ingratitude, which is not a spiritist. But it will, be, it will become spiritist when ingratitude leaves earth, to show that we will all follow the same path, because this incarnation will come. I recall in 1965, I was younger. Today I'm a little older, of course. I'm only 95 years old. Back then, it was the time of international communism. Cuba was rising from the opprobrium. Fidel had left Sierra Maestra to Havana. And there he was in the glory of his power when he applied the Marxist doctrine in his government with Che Guevara. And he started to kill the religious, priests, nuns, evangelics, Americans or not. And I had been a spiritist since I was 14. And I started to study spiritism and to practice it gradually since I was 17. Then I was so in love with it that while he was killing the Christians and preaching Marxism and its worst expression, I was praying. I prayed and prayed, and Juana de Angelis, my spiritual mentor, showed herself to me and asked, My son, you are praying so much. Why? And I said, Because I want to be a martyr. I want to go to Cuba, preach the Spiritist doctrine, of course. Soon I will be arrested. I will go to El Paradon, and they will shoot me down. I would like to ask you to ask Jesus, to allow me the Holocaust, to give my life for the Spiritism. And she looked at me with all the wisdom, and I'll never forget her eyes. Is it true, my son? I felt myself opening my arms, the bullets piercing me, and she said, no problem, I will talk to Father Francis, because I don't have the access to the Lord of Life, and he will ask the Lord to allow you this grace. I was in a state of grace. I will die for Spiritism, it was a glory. One week passed, one month passed, I said, but my sister, and she said, I still haven't got any news. At last one day she said, my son, Father Francis told me that the Lord conceived you the Holocaust. You will die for your faith. I said, my sister, so I will give my life for the gospel of Jesus. Yes, my son, there's only one detail. You don't need to go to Cuba, because your death won't be by rifle. It will be the death through defamation, incomprehension, through the daily struggle. You will die very slowly. And at the age of 95, I still haven't died. And there are bullets from everywhere. Bullets here, over there. And I run, hide, get up, and bullets, bullets. And so, how much I regret. I should have been more clear about it. But what a bless. Because pain. And it was then that I understood what she herself, with a pseudonym of a friendly spirit, had written and Kardec published in the Gospel according to Spiritism. The pain, the refining, the reparation, to do good as much as possible. When we do good, it's not to somebody, it's to ourselves. The good is good to the one who practices it. And the evil is bad to the one who does it. So in these grave times of challenges, of turmoil, let's dive into our thoughts, into the loving word of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Jesus and Alan Kardec as in our routes. There are extraordinary men and women who were Kardec's predecessors and successors, of course. But for our dimension, this moment, the Spiritism is an answer. It's the great SQ to our lives. In this way, let's fill it up with joy, without bitterness or resentment. Those who do us harm are so unhappy. They carry a cross that we ignore. Let's not add more weight to their burden. But what if I cannot forget? Great! Keep the memory of it forever, so you don't repeat the same mistake of doing evil again. So this is the great moment of spiritualization on earth. Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. The evil ones won't make you evil. It was what he said to the 500 of Galilee who multiplied. Who knows, some of these 500 had heard in that afternoon of farewells in Galilee when he ascended into the kingdom of heaven and told us to go preaching about it. Who knows, we are the heirs of Jesus Christ. Lord, I would like to thank you so much for the good you do me, the good you've done me, and the good you will do me. Thank you so much, Lord, for the air, the bread, the beauty that my eyes see on the altar of nature, eyes that see the sky, the earth, and the sea, that follow the fast bird that flies happily through the indigo sky and lingers on the green land sprinkled with flowers of a thousand hues. For my ability to see and for my eyes, I thank you. I want to tell you that I pray for those who cannot see. I know that after this life, in another life, they will see again. Thank you, Lord, so much for my ears that were given by God. Ears that hear the music of the people coming down the hill to the square singing around. The melody of the immortals that we listen once and never ever forget. The melodic glorious voice of the immortals. The melody that never ceases to vibrate in the feelings of our souls. Thank you so much because I can hear. But before those who cannot hear, I pray, because I know that after this pain, in your kingdom of love, they will hear again. Thank you so much, Lord, for my voice, but also for the voice that sings, for the voice that loves, that teaches the illiterate, that enlightens, for the voice that hums a song and speaks your name with kind emotion, for my ability to speak. I want to beg for the ones who suffer from aphasia. They don't speak at night, they don't sing during the day. I pray for them because I know that after this life, in another life, they will sing again. Thank you for my hands, for the hands that plow, that sow, for the hands that help, that shine, for the hands that shake hands, hands that take care of the elderly, of the pain, of the disaffection, for the hands that naturally cradles somebody else's child with no discomfort, and for the feet that take me to walk with Without complaint. Thank you so much, Lord, because I can walk. But before my perfect body, I want to praise you, Lord. Thank you so much because I have a home, a sweet little place, the gentle love, the tenderness of an angel. For my ability to have a family or not, I want to thank you because I believe you. But above all, because I was born. Thank you so much, Lord, for your love, for your attention. Thank you all, Mrs. and gentlemen.